Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Michele. Uh, I am a second year PhD student at ENS. Uh, I focus on secure and verifiable computation. And these days, I've been um, working more on uh, ZK SNARKs. And this is what the talk will be about. I study them together with Anka, right there, Rosario, somewhere in the audience, and also Michele Minelli. Um, so zero-knowledge SNARK, and more generally any zero-knowledge proof system, if you want a sort of a slow-motion version of what Jonathan Katz said, sort of solves the problem of a prover trying to prove something to the verifier without necessarily reveal revealing this something. So for example, you could say that uh, um, Rainbow Dash over here is this Microsoft server where I can sort of delegate the computation, and uh, I would like to have accountability for this server, and so Pinkie Pie would like to have a proof that this computation that has been remotely done sort of satisfies some properties. What we more formally say is that uh, the prover is an algorithm that takes as input a statement, in this case a circuit C, and a valid input for this statement, for the, for the circuit W, and um, sort of produces this cryptographic object, the proof, which is in turn taken by the verifier together with the statement, again, the circuit C, and the verifier can sort of decide if the proof works, was good, if the proof was convincing or not. Um, so um, ideally, we would like the proof to be in some sense sound and the prover not to leak a lot of information about the, the witness W, the, this valid input. So um, as you can see, we can sort of install some security definitions in here, and uh, they sort of explain the acronym of ZK SNARK. A zero knowledge snark is a uh, zk snark is zero knowledge zk s succinct and non interactive ar argument k of knowledge um, what does this mean well even before starting with this um, a proof system should be in some sense decent what we formally say should be complete that is to say that if everybody is honest if the prover produces standard proof and if the verifier verif the verify runs the verification algorithm then Every proof verifies and everybody is happy. After that, we would like it to be an argument of knowledge. This notion protects the verifier. What basically it says is that if you give me a proof, then I'm, I, you really must have known the and this proof verifies, then you must really have known the witness. What we formally say is that for any adversary that gives me this circuit C, the statement, and this proof, I can build an extractor. No, that uh, there exists an extractor that for any adversary selected circuit and for any proof is able to recover the witness. Then we will like also this um, protocol to be zero knowledge. This notion protects the prover. And it basically says that the proof does not leak any information other than the fact that this uh, input W satisfies the circuit. What we formally say is that there exists a simulator. We can create, construct a simulator that generates proof that are indistinguishable from honestly generated ones. And this proof can be simulated without knowledge of the witness. So as you can see, these sort of two properties sort of balance each other out, and we will see what this implies uh, a bit later. Succinct and non-interactive are properties that the proof should have. Succinct basically means that the proof should be constant size independent of the size of the circuit, the statement. Another way of formally saying this is that verification should take less time than iterating through the wall circuit. Um, Non-interactive basically means that we do not proceed through interaction. Is basically what we see over here. The proof goes like in a bum. I give you the proof, you can verify. There is no round of interaction involved. Um, so there are already some foundational results that tell us that, uh, as I said, zero knowledge argument of knowledge sort of balance each other out. So we cannot have this in the standard model. So the way we study these objects is in general in the CRS model. Basically, we assume that even before the parties start to in run the protocol, there is this setup that produces a common reference string. You can see that as a public key. And uh, using this sort of public key generated via the setup algorithm, the prover and the verifier can sort of carry out this protocol. And this will be useful in the security proof. Um, actually, in our case, we will work in the designated verifier scenario. So in addition to this CRS, the verifier will also get this sort of verification string, this additional information that will help him or her carry out the protocol. Um, so I decided I maybe there are some lattice people here, so I should do like a very quick 
introduction to ZK Snarks. And the basic idea below that, below the ones that at least I studied, is that you can represent circuit satisfy a problem of circuit satisfiability as a polynomial division problem. What this basically means is that instead of the circuit C over here, you can have you have a bunch of polynomials. Instead of this weakness W, you have a bunch of coefficients. And the proof is a linear combination of this polynomial with respect to these coefficients. And what the verifier does in, in order to understand whether the circuit is satisfied by W is sort of test that this linear combination is divided by some known polynomial called the target polynomial, which is part of the definition of, uh, of the circuit over here. And um, actually what we send is not really this, it, we do not really test for this division. We actually send a multiple and we sort of uh, see that it's in the correct span of these VIs. But the idea is, is always there. You can take a circuit that should be satisfied by W, translate it into polynomials, and check for this visibility. And this actually is a square span program, so you should have uh, some sort of understanding of the title by now. And there are other ways in which you can formalize uh, or represent a circuit. And uh, in sort of this polynomial divisibility way, there are, for example, quadratic arithmetic problems, programs and um, quadratic span programs, but the, the underlying idea is sort of uh, in the same vibes. Um, and we will focus on square span programs, which work for Boolean circuits, I should recall. Um, now, if we were to send directly these polynomials, we would break something. For example, the proof would not be succinct because the degree of this polynomial would depend on the size of the circuit. Um, so what we generally do is that uh, instead of sending the polynomial, we send the valuation of a polynomial over a random point. So we fix the polynomial, we select a point, we evaluate the polynomial of this random point, and through some probabilistic argument, basically schwartz zippel we say that if the valuation divides, then also the two polynomial divides. Again, is this is not really testing for divisibility, we're doing something more, uh, more involved, but this should give you an idea. And um, so how do we evaluate in this point? If we don't know it, well, we use public key encryption. So if we were to think of this uh, as uh, in terms of elliptic course, which is basically the thing that is implemented these days, we give a bunch, uh, we select this random point during the setup phase, and we do scalar multiplication of uh, successive powers of S to upper bound the degree of this polynomial. And then we can evaluate um, in this, into this point S without really knowing it by doing scalar multiplication and group addition. Um, remember that there was some quadratic equation that the verifier needs to test, and the, the, we, this one we can do it with pairings. This is a very, very hand-waved intuition. Um, why is this secure? Well, it is zero knowledge because basically we can randomize the polynomial. If we randomize the polynomial, we can sort of uh, hide the coefficients wi, and so we have, uh, we, we have zero knowledge. This is also very end waved. It's an argument of knowledge because we generally use these knowledge assumptions. These knowledge assumptions basically means that the only thing morally, it means that the only thing an adversary can do over these powers of S is uh, our linear operations. And therefore, from this evaluation that, that uh, the adversary potentially gives us V of, uh, of this polynomial, we can extract the coefficient and the coefficients and therefore extract the weakness. Um, this sort of helped us prove um, that it is an argument of knowledge. Um, so what did we do? We basically took this protocol, this zero knowledge NARC that was done on uh, um, square span programs, and we brought it to post quantum assumption. So what we more formally did was we sort of brought this protocol to the notion of encoding that was done by Gennaro and others in 2013. We changed it a bit, this notion of encoding, to accommodate for the noisy nature of lattice encodings. And uh, then we provided an easy instantiation of it with a reg of encryption. What this more precisely means is that, for example, you can uh, see this instantiate this protocol using symmetric reg of encryption, which basically means that if you want to encrypt a message S, with your key, you basically do scalar product of the key with a random vector, you add the error, you add the message. And this you do for all the powers of S. Now you can construct the, uh, the evaluation, you can evaluate this polynomial over S because up to some number crunching on the parameters, you, need, you can perform linear operations 
on these lattice encodings. But on the other side, you cannot really perform pairings on the side of the verifier. So this is where uh, the verification strings come in because we moved the so there, this is the reason why we move to the designated verifier case, where we, ba we basically give the secret key to open these uh, encodings to the verifier. The verifier can therefore test for divisibility, and sort of the proof goes in a similar way to the to the group case. Uh, more precisely, why is this secure? This is always the question. So this zero knowledge because we can, again, randomize the polynomial, but we cannot stop there because we have, for example, a random vector and an error which depend on the linear combination that we did to evaluate this polynomial V. So we use leftover hash lemma, which you should know everything about if you follow the last talk, I guess, um, for uh, for the, um, to show that uh, the random vector do not leak any information and smudging to sort of hide the linear combination relationship that was uh, uh, that was really given in, inside the error. Um, why is it, is it an argument of knowledge? Because we brought those knowledge assumptions that were, um, we sort of introduced those knowledge assumptions by some knowledge assumptions that were before used in the, in the case of groups, and we migrated them to the case of uh, lattice encodings, and specifically to symmetric regev. And actually, we prove them to be uh, weaker than assumption using in um, some concurrent work by Yuval and others, which is, by the way, much better than ours in some uh, for some other reasons. Um, and uh, and we also had to slightly change the protocols uh, in order to allow a reduction to these knowledge assumptions. I uh, hope this was sort of uh, understandable. Uh, so repeating once again, what we did was uh, we introduced designated verifier, zero knowledge narcs, using lattice assumptions. And why I believe this is important, for example, in practice, is that we can have post-quantum verifiable computation. So these days we have all these uh, FHE papers, but we have really no ways no way of uh, sort of attesting that the computation was done correctly. And hopefully this will help. And why is this useful in theory? Well, at least at the time we were working on this, there was literally no paper or it was still an open problem to provide zero knowledge on lattices or provide arguments of knowledge on lattices. And we thought this was a sort of a way in which we could provide both. Um, we also implemented it. We implemented it in C using new MP and Flint. Uh, we also contributed back to those libraries. Uh, turned out it's, um, it's not like documented or anything, but I think the code is pretty readable. Um, it turns out that it is pretty slow. So if you wanted to get an idea what in Pinocchio you can do like in 10 seconds, for example, for computing SHA-1, uh, in our case, it would take you more like 50 seconds. And um, the proof size is in the, like half a megabyte. It's not really... <laughs> Is not really some bytes, uh, as in the case of Pinocchio. And ah, for uh, the people not familiar with NARCs, uh, you generally name implementation after Pinocchio character, apparently. So basically, we choose Manjafuoco because it's like is this very very cumbersome protocol with, with this enormous proof. But I think it has some some good reasons for being there. So um, I can give some more details. I think there are, there is a lot of time for questions. So. So, Hello. Yes. hi, uh, I am Mariana. I actually came up with the Pinocchio name, but I don't yeah, think Yeah, yeah, it's uh, sort of uh, wanted to... I don't think that everybody's followed. <laughs> so you, you mentioned that you think that your extraction assumption is weaker than the linear targeted malleability in the work of Bonnet. Yes. Why is that? I thought that linear targeted is in general weaker type of... Uh, actually, it's uh, what we confronted with was linear only. And we assume we managed at least we can check together a paper, but we proved that if you have the QTH power DF element together with uh, uh, in CPA, we prove a reduction to linear only assumption. And I think morally the reason is that when you have Q power DF element, you have to send uh, the consecutive powers and then the consecutive powers times some other coefficient. Whereas in the linear only, you just send only one of them. And in our I'm not sure if so if I if I am doing knowledge of exponent assumption, I have to send you all the powers of S and all the powers of S times beta. 
In the case of linear only, I have only to send you all the powers of s. And from that, you can extract the coefficients. But I in the linear only, my, yes. My, my question is... Uh, ah, yeah, yeah, sorry, 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 yes. We, cons we co actually compare it to extractable linear only because we are doing arguments of knowledge. And that were what we want to... to can, you, can you prove to me that uh, you are extract... That, that extractable linear only is implied by, our, by um, this sort of q power Diffie-Hellman moved on lattices? Yes, I can prove it to you and we can check the paper afterwards. Okay, so the claim is that the, uh, the extraction assumption is strictly weaker than the linear yeah. only assumption. The extractable linear only. Okay, okay, no. okay. <laughs> Thanks, Ian. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm trying to formulate the question, so I was just sitting there. So, it just seems a little weird to still call it the common reference string model if the verifier can just construct, like in this model, the verifier can construct the reference string. At least what you've shown. Um, actually, we proved it in the case where a trusted entity generates the common reference string and also the, the string for the verifier. We, we should. Are there things in the reference string you didn't show us? Uh, no, except for us. the trapdoor for the extractor, no. Oh, but there's a. There is a trapdoor oh, for the extractor. for the extractor is the extra thing. I cannot consider the CRS because it's not zero knowledge anymore. It brings zero knowledge, it's malicious. But you give S to the ver you give the decryption yeah. to the yeah. verifier, and yeah. the common reference string was just encryptions of powers yeah. of S. So the verifier, so the verifier is potentially able S. to forge proof. Yes, but in, in our security model, it's still okay. No, that's okay. It's okay for the verifier to be able to forge proofs in designated verifier, but it. So your question is: Everything Can the verifier produce the CRS? the CRS? The verifier could have produced. It. Not in our, not not for the security proof we gave. I think this is an interesting question. I asked myself that question a few weeks ago, and probably I should look into that. Because the verifier could encrypt different things. Yeah. You yeah. need you need to have the CRS to be encryption on those proper powers. Yeah. Like if the verifier encrypts something else, it then you you don't don't know. Know. Oh, because the ver if the verifier did dishonestly. Fair enough. Okay. Yep. Good. Thanks.